Thank you very much indeed. I'm genuinely humbled to um, see so many of you, and I am, feel a sense of obligation to my patients, some of whom are in the room, to not disappoint you. So um, I'll do my best to make this appropriate um, to what I hope um, I can excite you about. I think I, there's a sort of a twin challenge here. One is to, for those of you who are sufferers, to tell you about something which you know about, because you experience this, or have a loved one who does. And the second is to excite you that actually, for a long time, this has been a real Cinderella area. It's been something which has been, although it accounts for the vast majority of our work, as you can see at the bottom there, it's been something we've regarded as not having much academic clout. It's the thing you diagnose when you've got all the interesting diseases excluded, and then you're left with this patient who you don't really want to see, and the patient doesn't want to be seeing you, and you end up with not really very sensible things that are available to us being used. And what I hope is really transformed things is that we've gone back to where we should always begin medicine, which is essentially that thing about the relationship between you and your, your healthcare person, doctor, nurse, or whoever it is. And we've gone back to that, and most of what I'll tell you has evolved in terms of the science of this, has been a mixture of taking patients' reports and trying to dig up the science in that, rather than taking the patient's report as being, well, yes, yes, I know it's a bit of a nuisance to you, but let's get you out of the room. It's actually taking that and saying, where, where, where is the gold in what you're saying, and how can we exploit that? And there is stuff worth exploiting. It's worth exploiting as a country because we spend a small fortune on this. We probably spend, it's estimated, about three billion pounds at least on treating uh, IBS-type things, either through drugs or t pads or time off work or things like that. So this is a big deal for us uh, as, a, as an individual, as a country, let alone as individuals. And I say this, I've put this slide up with a sense of apology. It's not meant to be amusing, but it's meant to be a regret, really. And I think the problem is that when you start off with IBS, there's a tendency for sometimes for the doctor, and I use this as doctor rather than nurse, for the doctor to regard the patient as the other. And I think we always feel that patients understandably want a cure. If I come along with a symptom, if I have a, a leaky radiate in my car, I don't want the chap to tell me, yes, yes, I, it's a bit of a problem, I can do something with that, it may leak a bit, but it's fine. I want a cure, I want somebody to tell me exactly what he's gonna do, he's gonna replace this part or put that in there. And we perceive that's what um, the patients want. And the patients perceive us as be believing that everything is in their mind. They believe that we often, they leave the room feeling that we're saying to them essentially, there's nothing wrong with you, it's in your head. And that's completely and utterly wrong. Anything I say which revolves around talking about the personality of the person or the psyche and the emotional state is absolutely critical to understanding where the patient comes from, not because it says this is an expression of some sort of malingering or any other psychological process. There's an importance to understand how this incredibly dark, mysterious organ here, which is the seat of our satiety and our comfort and our satisfaction, how that relates to that big sense of satisfaction we have up here. And there is a science in some of that stuff, and that's what's really exciting. And I say this from the perspective of somebody who started off life as a neurologist, and I didn't make it very, uh, very well in that career, and so I wandered into the gut by mistake, and here I am. <laughs> There's a very conventional bit of IBS story that we tell. We talk about when you come to see the doctor, there's a set of things we do, and I put this up as a shopping list. I don't want to dwell on this, but your doctor should and will do a set of things on you, We're starting off from the fairly basic things through to occasionally doing something more complex like Mark has shown you old-fashioned endoscopies for. And then if there's a suspicion that there's something really unusual, i.e. not IBS, although you may have been labeled as having IBS, they may send you along for some specialist tests. That's the sort of the pyramid of care. I don't want to dwell on that. What is much more interesting, and I guess I hope I'm I'm going to be a bit preachy for one slide, is this important message, which is when the doctor does eventually give you that diagnosis, that says, yes, you do have IBS. This is a positive diagnosis. This isn't, I don't know what it is, let's call it IBS. That's wrong. This is, no, look, I know your symptoms absolutely speak to me of this condition. Reassuringly, your tests are negative. When you do that, you find that this is an extraordinarily stable diagnosis. Okay, this is a condition where once it's been diagnosed properly, the chances of recurring or of causing something else arising are actually less than in any of the other conventional GI conditions which can get complications. So this should be a source of reassurance that we need to be able to convey to our patients better. And of course, there are things that we recognize that predict 
who will be in that little red, tiny red wedge. We can identify those patients, hopefully, by some of the very conventional things. This is all very well-established, old-school knowledge. I put that in there because it, I, hope, I hope to gently cause a bit of consternation amongst the men in the room. A big issue for me is men don't report gut symptoms. For some reason, we believe it's part of our machismo. It's part of eating 15 pints or, and a couple of curries, and yeah, yeah, I had a bit of bleeding, yeah, I had a bit of gut ache, but it's fine. You know what? It may not be fine. And if you're a man who's had symptoms for a while, just think about speaking to somebody about it. But that's a bit preachy. I apologize for that. The other side of that coin is that this is a condition which primarily is diagnosed in women, and it's diagnosed in women of childbearing years. Okay, only about 10% of people who are diagnosed are diagnosed after the age of 50. The vast majority of patients are diagnosed in their teens and 20s. And this is the kind of figure that I find slightly horrible, but I hope to make a point out of it. It reflects, I think, the key thing, which is this is a condition which affects the whole person, but is manifest, the window to this condition is through your belly. Right in the center of the expression of your symptoms is your belly. There may be countless things in there which contribute towards it, of which the big thing on top of your body is rather important, but it's a condition through the window which you see in your, in your body. I find this figure slightly upsetting. What I find a more useful figure as a neurologist by training is this figure, which tells us this. <laughs> There is this hugely nervous organ in here, and there's a massively nervous organ in here. Nervous is in the sense of having nervous tissue in it. And there's a link between, in fact, your gut has more nerves in it than your spinal cord. Okay, this is an exceptionally nervous organ. And that relationship of how nerves work refers to two things. How every nerve in your body works, it works by getting messages in terms of feeling, messages from the outside. I can feel this white thing here. I can feel this furry thing here. I can feel things, which is the part that's called the afferent mechanism, and then I then perceive that. It comes up here and I make sense of it. I know this is something fluffy. I know this is something smooth, not because I'm looking at it, but because I've learned that. And that process requires my brain to process that and remove any inhibitory feelings I have about that texture and make sense of it. Now that's something as simple as something which we can all see. This is happening constantly in your gut. Every second now, every moment is spent with messages shooting up to your brain. Many more when you wake up, many more when you eat, many more when you're aroused, going up here and your brain processing them. You only think of your gut in a couple of times a day. One is when you need to eat, and one is when you've had enough, and maybe when you need to go to the toilet, and that's about it. But there's a constant dialogue between here and here, and here and here, to keep that system in regulation. And these various things that can cause distress and ultimately lead to IBS can be processed around those things which cause abnormal sensation from the periphery and those things which cause abnormal processing of that information from the periphery. And that's a helpful schema because it allows us to grade patients in a way which takes into account the severity of their symptoms but also allows us to gauge treatment along the bottom of that there. Now, I want to try and build up on this complexity with a study which I'm really honored to present uh, on behalf of somebody who's in the audience, uh, Nick Reed, who undertook this study. And Professor Reed did a really rather landmark thing, which in some ways is bleeding obvious. For years and years, patients have been saying to us, oh, this all began when I began, when I, after a gut infection. And we said, no, it didn't. You just began to notice it after that, go away. And what Nick did was to listen to patients and identify that for a quarter of patients who, were given, who had a severe gastroenteritis, severe enough to send them into a casualty, for a quarter of them, they developed IBS symptoms after that. Having had no trouble beforehand, a quarter of people who had gastroenteritis went on to have IBS symptoms. And what marked them out was not the necessarily the infection they had, but certain predispositions they had in terms of what, how they behaved and how they thought. Now, that isn't to say that IBS is purely a mental condition. Far from it. It's to reflect that complexity of how the gut works and how the brain works and how sometimes a seed falls in fertile soil. And when that seed falls in the right soil, it can result in, in problems which can then manifest in the longer term. And that's the first process, I think, by which we begin to understand how patients experience things. And we can now postulate mechanisms whereby, as somebody alluded to earlier on, there may be a slightly more leaky gut in these patients. Maybe some of this nervousness, some of these nerve messages which makes us feel anxious or which expose us to life experiences may have a correlate, may have a, a physical reflection in how our guts are, and then when the infection comes along, that's working against a slightly more porous gut 
which can then allow something through the door which shouldn't allow it. And that's a concept which is increasingly evolving and certainly is evolved by people talking about probiotics. And traditionally, doctors have increasingly now begun to, rather than just say IBS is a big sort of messy network, we now begin to say, look, what are the symptoms that are bothering you most that we can tackle? And of course, sometimes we tackle them by labeling them very formally through criteria. But actually, as a doctor and a patient, what we do is we say, look, what is it you're suffering with most? And rather than trying to cure some nebula syndrome, which is so complicated, as I'm hoping you're getting the flavor of, let's focus on the symptoms we can really understand and treat those and gradually try and strip away what's left. And we can do this by deciding how, frequent, how frequently your stools are abnormal. This is a very complicated figure. What it tells you is that by using a very, very simple thing, which you've probably all seen in your doctor's offices, this kind of uh, rather, I used to think is rather grotesque, but actually I've come to slightly love it. Uh, <laughs> because it gets, again, back to men, men who find it very difficult to talk about stools, will suddenly say, well, I have one of those, actually. It's about a five, anyway. Don't look, don't look at me in the eye. And they will point to something. And it's a form of communication which allows people to... And, you, and it's interesting that one of the many messages is that we tend to breed true to ourselves. We either are people who fluctuate from one to seven, or we are always seven or one, or we are always... Uh, five or six. We tend not to say, well, I used to be for three months a type one, and then for three months I was a type seven, and then we tend to be breed fairly true. And that's what this rather beautiful survey says, which is when you ask patients to keep a diary, and this is a very complicated figure, patients to keep a diary, they tell you something which they don't tell you when you come to see us. So if there's one first take home message from what I've been chuntering away about, it's to tr please, please, when you come to see a doctor, keep a mental note or if not a diary note of what's been happening to your bowel. Because when we know, when you come in, we ask you questions very didactically. How long have you had this? What's it? Is it hard or is it soft? You will tend to answer according to what you want to do to please us, but according to what the most severe recent thing you've had done is. And it's much better to actually have something objective in terms of something diarized. And when we do that, what this horrible figure tells you is that people we often diagnose having mixed type IBS, mixing between here and here, actually, when we, that's what we find in, in clinic. Actually, it's a tiny minority who have this problem in real life, in, according to the diary. So we must ask you, if that's okay with you, to try and focus on what this tells us. Now, I want to spend the next five minutes, if I may, talking about constipation. I am slightly obsessed by people not reporting constipation because there is a ton we can do for this. This isn't some horrible thing which you have to live with. There is lots we can do for patients who suffer with constipation. I, th I am a strong believer in explanatory models. I think we need to have a working understanding of what's going on here. This is a dark, mysterious organ, and we need to try and persuade you that there is something which is explicable here. For me, the analogy is toothpaste from a tube. To get the toothpaste out, you've got to squeeze the tube, you've got to take the lid off. No point just doing the one nothing comes out. You've got to do them both and do them in the right order. And this for me is a form of explanatory model which allows me to then say, look, we have a drug or we have something we can do which gives you more squeeze in the tube. We have a treatment which allows you to take the lid off. It's something like that which then makes sense. Otherwise, we end up saying, well, here's a drug, try it, go away, come back in a month's time, see if it's worked. And that makes no sense because if we want to come back to my radiator in the car, if we want it to run properly, I need to sort of tell you I fixed it and then come back in a month if it is still leaking. We need to have some outcome measure. And we often have treated constipation as being something, well, it's constipation, take the next laxative on the block and then leave and come back some other time. And this is the, this is the, the explanatory model. If there's something I'm, second thing I'd like to offer from diaries, try and get your doctor or your nurse who's seeing you to give you an explanatory model of what it is they think is going on with you, which, which makes sense to you. I often talk about a muscular tube, a muscular tube which has a nerve supply which we can respond to. And some people's nerve supply to it is too quick and some people's is too slow. And some people, and we, I go through this, I have these on an app on my in clinic and I sit with patients and I talk them through this and I show them little arrows going up and down. And I find this a dynamic way of, for me, trying to express something which I can't express through my limited vocabulary. And I think this is an essential thing, not necessarily to do something like that, but to get an explanatory model of what's going on in your gut. And that nervous tube then has a nervous connection with your brain. And why is it that you get butterflies in your tummy? Why do you get a nervous, why do you get a bit of a diarrhea before you do a presentation or those things? There's a very rational explanation for that in terms of the nerve supply between your spinal cord, your brain, and your gut. And we can try and explain this to try and rationalize it, why people feel, well, maybe I'm a bit bonkers. Maybe I shouldn't 
maybe I'm imagining this. Maybe it's gone so long that I've just begun to think maybe this is actually not happening to me. No, it is happening to you. And trying to communicate that is a rather important mechanism and trying to explain how the brain is sometimes overly sensitized to here and how this is sometimes overly preachy to that. And that's some of the exciting stuff that science has shown us how to do the technicality of it, but actually it's about coming back to the clinic and making people feel better about what they do. A big part of this for the last couple of minutes is just to also say that I want to hopefully dispel some myths that you may have. So is everything about fiber? The answer is no, it's not always about fiber. Is it that you have that taking laxatives for a long time makes you uh, have a, a bad bowel? No, it doesn't, okay? All those things you worry about. Constipation is bad for me. Constipation means that I've got a sewer in my body. Constipation means I'm going to get cancer. Laxatives means I'm going to get a lazy bowel. There's really no evidence to support this. We've looked. It's not as though people haven't looked. People have looked, and they haven't found any of these things here. Will laxatives give me cancer? Will all these things? There is really no evidence to support any of these things there. So I want to just keep moving through and finally to ask you to think about your diet. We know that for most people, your diet doesn't give you quite enough fiber for what you need. If you look at this little game show at the bottom here, five servings of fruit and veg, your five a day only gives you about 10 to 15 grams of fiber a day. And bear in mind that a woman needs 25 grams and a man about 35 grams of fiber a day. So if you look at a normal quant portion of, of any of these veg and fruit, you'd have to take a hell of a lot of them to get your, if you're five a day, would never get you any there. You know, five pairs a day will give you 15 grams, which is you know, half of what a man needs. And it's only when you get into the insoluble fibers, these cereal fibers, that actually you make some headway with this. So what I want to persuade you of, if that's okay with you, is that it's really critically important to be able to voice what it is you're concerned about in terms of the symptoms that bother you most, because the doctors and nurses will approach you by symptoms that are most troublesome to you. Secondly, to focus strongly and avidly on diarizing what is happening to your gut how often you're going, what's coming out, how much of an effort is it going to go, are you able to control it, are there times when you get the urge and you don't make it. It's mortifying to talk about, but somehow putting it in a piece of paper and diary makes it easier to communicate that. And that's a critical symptom. One in 20 of us sitting in this room have soiled underwear on a weekly basis. Okay, that's a big deal. That's a hell of a big deal. And we don't handle that very well as doctors, and patients don't handle it very well in terms of telling us either because they feel it's something personal. So I guess what I'm trying to say to in conclusion is that there is tons of science out there in terms of all this, but most of that science really only works when you have the patient feeling that the doctor seeing them understands the problem. So don't, don't hide a symptom. If it helps put in a diary, put it down there. If it helps to talk it out easier, talk it out. And that allows the physician who's looking after you to then in turn explain and rationalize some of the science behind this. And actually there's tons we can do. We can rationally use treatments to help laxatives, to you help with uh, emptying of the bowel, to help with holding onto the bowel if there's diarrheal tendencies, and to help with pain. But rather than regarding IBS as a big unholy network, it's about picking off the symptoms that trouble you as an individual most and that have the biggest impact on you and your quality of life. Thank you very much for your patience.